Welcome to Sierra Community Church, everybody. So glad that you're here to worship with us today. Let's all stand. We're going to ask the Lord to just open the heavens and show us himself. Let's lift our voices.
strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Surely my God is the strength of my soul.
Christ is mine forevermore. Christ is mine forevermore. Amen. His promises will always hold true. We can trust in him.
we confess, I just want to take a moment here to allow all of us to confess, to bring our offerings, to bring whatever burdens us this morning, things that we've carried around all week that maybe you have gone under the radar, we just haven't noticed where we have offended you, where we have hurt your heart, where we have hurt others around us, God. Just bring that to our minds so that we can repent and allow your voice to be louder in our lives, God, because it's when, it's when we hold out from you and we don't give you what you ask of us that we don't hear you properly, Lord. So I pray that, that we would just be able to search our hearts, that we would truly be able to walk away today blessing you when we feel like all the weapons of the world are forming against us and we're we're downtrodden and we're, we're hurting God, but we can still bless your name. And we know that you have given us all the strength in your spirit, God, to do what you've asked us to do. We can walk away and bless your name no matter what our circumstances are, God, no matter what we're facing. Would you work in this place, God, with your spirit? Just speak to us, change our hearts, free us from what binds us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Welcome to Sierra Community Church. Glad that you're with us today. If you're visiting, first time, hope that this turns out to be a, an excellent Sunday morning as we worship Jesus together. Now, we got a little bit of family news before we jump into the Word of God. Tomorrow night, we are having a baptism service and something as a pastor I'm so excited to do, which is to celebrate people's commitment to their faith in Jesus through baptisms. So I, I don't know exactly how many have close to 10 baptisms tomorrow night. We're going to sing and have some worship as well. So I would love for all of you to come. Mm -hmm. Maybe not all of you. <laughs> That'd be hard to fit. No, just kind of, you come, everybody. It's 6.30 tomorrow night as we celebrate people in their uh, giving their testimonies and and their commitment to Jesus. So what a wonderful thing to get to, to do together. Hope you'll join us tomorrow night. In lieu of that, uh, we are grateful the lab who normally meets on Monday nights for their Bible study, they're going to take tomorrow night off. So if you were planning on coming to that, why don't you come to the baptism instead and join us for that? They will start again the following week. So just to keep that note, this is a great study. Happens every Monday night. Guys get to go through the Bible and Bible Project videos. Lots of good things together. So would encourage you to check that out, but not tomorrow because they won't be meeting. Now we have a men's group that meets uh, Wednesday nights here, and they're going to start a new study in the book of James, April 17th. Great book, great group of guys. They, they have a meal together. They share communion. And as they go through the book of James, they've got a study guide that is available. Mike is, has a table back there, so go see him back there. He'll give you all the information that you need about that. Again, they're starting coming up. That would be this Wednesday. So let me at 6.30 here. We also have a date night coming up. That's going to be this Friday, 6 to 8 p.m. If you don't know what date night is, it's an opportunity for those of you with little ones to bring them here and drop them off for free childcare so we can play games with them and you and your spouse can go out on a date. It's one of the ways that we'd like to invest into marriages at Sierra. So there's one way to do this, and that is to contact Nick at Sierra.Church. Get signed up for that so he knows how many people to, uh, to recruit to watch the kids. And we really don't have much time for this. Really, it's coming up this Friday. So make sure that you get in touch with Nick. He's standing right over there. You can go grab him and talk to him now. Well, not now. You can talk to him after the service. Or you can email him, Nick at Sierra.Church. Yes, very simple. Okay, and then one other thing that I want to mention before we dismiss everybody, you know, a few months ago we talked about just being a little bit more open with our budget and where we're at, and so we're our first quarter in, and I just wanted to give you a quick budget. We are doing really well. Thank you very much. We are about 10000 behind, but that's a small percentage of where we're at for the year, so this is an opportunity just to fill you in on where we're at with that, but also to say thank you so much. 
for your generosity every single week here at Sierra, not just in the tithes that you give, but in what you give during the week in service and the ministries that go on here. So grateful to be a part of this family. So with that, we're going to dismiss our kids to their Sunday school classes. Everybody else, why don't you get up and welcome somebody. Let's grab a seat, everybody. Let's grab a seat and get started. Okay, here we go. We are in the book of Ephesians, and we're actually going to finish the book today. So before we do that, I, I think it's important to answer the question, why are we even in the book of Ephesians? How did, how did we get here? Well, actually, we were working our way through the book of Acts. And really, when we got to the, the latter half, where the emphasis is on Paul's missionary journeys through uh, really that North Asia Minor and into Macedonia and those areas, we thought, well, maybe we should stop along the way and look at a few of the letters that Paul wrote when he was on these journeys. And so now his home base is really in that spot up there, highlighted a place called Antioch, is the capital of Syria at the time, and a place where God had really brought this multi-ethnic, multicultural group of people, Jew, Gentile, all together under the name of Christ. The Holy Spirit was very active among them, and it became this hub where Paul and Silas and Barnabas and John Mark and a lot of other people were sent out 
as missionaries. And so Paul travels on that northern route, and he goes through the area, the region of Galatia. And so we stopped and we looked at his letter to the Church of the Galatians. And Paul, again, talking about the unity of Jew and Gentile, putting their differences aside, coming together, sharing communion with one another under the banner of Christ. And Paul continues on that journey and ends up in a place called Ephesus. He, he's here for really the longest in any place that he stops on any one of his missionary journeys. He's there for a little over two years and makes some very good friends there. Now, when he writes this letter, it's, it's well after that. He's actually in prison when he writes this letter back to the church in Ephesus, which is where we find ourselves today. And since we're going to finish the letter, it, it, this is important. That, and John did a great job of this last week. It's so easy for us to look at letters in the Bible that were written to a, a group a long time ago and to pull phrases out of context, out of the context of the whole letter, and then you know, misunderstand or misinterpret what they actually mean for us. So when we read little parts like this, and today's passage is really a great example of that. I mean, this is when you're talking about the armor of God. This is something that you find on T-shirts and coffee mugs. And that's fine, but it needs to be understood in the context of the entire letter because Paul is, is concluding what he said over the last five chapters. This isn't a standalone. This is really connected to everything that he's, that he's already said. So with that, I want to go back and just kind of give an overview of the entire letter and how we got here. And we'll start with just a quick video that, that starts that off. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The story of how Paul came to the city of Ephesus is really interesting. You can go read about it in Acts chapter 19. Ephesus was a huge city. It was the epicenter of worship for most of the Greek and Roman gods. And for over two years, Paul had a really effective missionary presence there, and lots of people became followers of Jesus. Years later, after being imprisoned by the Romans, Paul wrote this letter. The movement of thought in the letter divides into two really clear halves. In the first half, Paul is exploring the story of the gospel, how all history came to its climax in Jesus and in his creation of this multi-ethnic community of his followers. The second half of the letter is linked to the first by the word, therefore. And here Paul explores how the gospel story should affect how we live every part of our life story, personally, in our neighborhoods and communities and in our families. So we look at this letter really in, in two halves. The first half, as, as he just said, is the, the gospel. That just means the good news, the story of Jesus, who he is, what he's done for us and in us. And then the second half of that letter, Paul often does this in his letters, in, spy, in light of or therefore or because of, now here is our response, who we are in Jesus because of what he's done for us. And so he talks about this amazing thing that God has done and, and brought Jews and Gentiles into this new humanity, this new community of believers under the headship of Christ. And it happens through the power of God's Holy Spirit, which is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. This is what enables us to, to come together. Even though we had differences before, we come together together under the name of Jesus. We become one, one body, one spirit, one God, one faith, one baptism, not for the sake of just uniformity, but unity within our differences. It's actually good that we all come from different walks of life and have different gifts and talents because God wants us to bring those together to use them for the edification of the building up of the body, to serve each other, and, and when we do that, we represent the new humanity and creation under the authority of Christ. He is the head. And because of that, we, we are to put off the old self, lying and deceit and anger and stealing, sexual immorality. Those things are to go away and they're to be replaced with the new humanity. The, new, the character of God is what we're replacing this with, with honesty, with generosity, with faithfulness, forgiveness, all of those things because we are actively being filled by God's Spirit. And when God's Spirit fills us, then these are the things that come out. And there's a new social order that's created. We submit to Christ and to each other, which really shakes things up. 
which also means there will be pressure against this movement. So we need to be prepared. And all of those things that we're going to talk about today are attributes of God. They're the character, they're the characteristics of God that we put on. The armor is, is all about God's character protecting us. And so we have to do that because there's going to be pressure. There's going to be pushback. And the end goal of all of this is that there be one unified body of believers under the headship of Christ. That's what we call the church. And it's a, there's a global church, a worldwide church, and there's a local church. And I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the gathering of believers in Jesus. And all of this is for the glory of God. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to chapter 6. We're going to finish the rest of the book, verses 10 through 24. I'll have it on the screen for you as well. So the Apostle Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That word schemes is a Greek word where we get our word, our English word, methods. So it's stand firm against the methods of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray... Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Tychicus the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you everything so that you may know how I am and what I'm doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ and with an undying love. Father, we come before you this morning, we are grateful, grateful for your word, grateful for the encouragement that we find in it. Every one of us knows what it's like to struggle in life, to figure out what, what it means to, to follow you faithfully with all of the pressures of this world, asking us to, to give our allegiance, our commitment, our faith to something other than you. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would encourage us today. Give me, as, I, as Paul asked, give me the words to preach to say, and may our hearts be ready to receive everything that you have for us today. Lord, I, I also just want to say thank you for your protection of Israel. You know, the events that happened last night, it is amazing to be reminded of passages like Psalm 120, 121 that tell us you are the protector of Israel. When we look to the mountains, where does our help come from? It comes from you. And so, Lord, thank you for your protection for your people. Thank you for your protection for us. May you guide us and help us to surrender everything that we are to you today. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, there is a lot in here. So what I'm going to do is look at it really in, in three different, from three different perspectives. Paul's using military language in here, which he doesn't use very often. So I, I want to first talk about what, what are we supposed to be fighting for? He, Paul says there's a danger here, and you need to fight 
uh, for something, not just against, but for something. So we're going to talk about that. What are we fighting for? The second thing is, what are we fighting against? There is an enemy. Paul says very clearly, we have an enemy. So who is that? Who are we fighting against? And the last part is, how do we prepare for that fight? What does that fight look like? That's really the three sections that we're talking about. And remember, everything that Paul's talking about here is connected to all of the letter of Ephesians. He, he will quote chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 as he works his way through this. So this is the culmination, the conclusion of this letter. So what are we fighting for? And I, I think that what Paul is ultimately saying is he said this to the Galatians. He says this also to the Colossians. He, we are fighting for the glory of God through the unity of the believers that we would be this one united body under the headship of Christ, and that brings God glory. That's what we're fighting for, the unity of our brothers and sisters. If you're, if you're scattered and just going off in, in different directions, there's no cohesive direction. There's no, there's no unity. And God is a God of order. He takes chaos and brings it into order, and that is what the church is supposed to look like. You know, I, I've made the mistake over so many years reading passages like this, this one specifically, and thinking that really only in individualistic terms. It is this, you know, my sword of the spirit and my breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation that protects me from wandering away from God. Yes. And there's truth to that. But the way that Paul is addressing these people in Ephesus, he's doing it as a community. Remember, when he says you, he, he doesn't mean individually you. He's talking in plural, you all. Y'all stand firm. Y'all resist. That's, that's what Paul is saying, because the community of believers is meant to protect one another, to fight for one another for the sake of unity. Paul would say this in chapter 4, make every effort to keep the unity. Notice, not make the unity, keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Which, again, is why this language that Paul's using of a battle and armor is so fitting. Because you, you don't go to battle by yourself. If you do, you're going to lose very quickly. Because you're, you're outnumbered. So you don't just go off and fight it by yourself. That's not how battles are won. They're, they're, they're won within numbers. And you're not just fighting for yourself. You're fighting with and for the people that are a part of your community and a part of your body. Individually, you are a part of a greater body. And the enemy's goal is to work against everything that Christ has done. And so if Christ has been able to accomplish bringing Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free, all together under the headship of Jesus, then it's the enemy's goal to bring chaos into that, to cause disruption in that, to convince us that the church is not something, the body that we are called to be a part of. That's what he's going to do. See, unity is, it, it's never something that is static. Unity is maintained through effort. You, you don't, it just doesn't stay. You, you forgive people and you maintain unity. You have grace with each other and you maintain unity. Unity, because we all make mistakes, and we need to have grace for each other when we do. That's part of the goal. See, that's why Paul's language is so, it's, it's so proactive here. Look what he says. He says, be strong, not on your own, but in God's power. Put on the full armor of God. Take your stand, because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So put on that armor. That's what's going to enable you to take a stand. The enemy doesn't want the church to grow. The enemy wants the church to be filled with scandals, with, uh, filled with corrupt leaders, or, or just that, that we would fight each other from the inside so much that the whole thing would collapse. He doesn't care how it happens. He just wants to bring chaos into the body of Christ. Now, I want to give you a couple visuals here that, that make this point, I think. Most of us are familiar with images like this. I grew up watching this stuff. I remember this is like wild world of animals, you know, mutual of Omaha stuff. And so 
we all know how this story ends most of the time. So sometimes the gazelle gets away. Most of the time, um, the lion's going to have dinner in this story. And the first question that you want to ask is, where's the herd? Why is the gazelle by itself? And the point is, the gazelle has been moved away from the safety of the herd, from the protection of others into a place by itself. And by itself, it's vulnerable. By itself, it's weaker than when it's with the body. And because of that, the lion separates so that he can then attack a vulnerability. Peter would make this point. Be alert and of sober mind. The enemy, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. That is the exact language that Paul is using. Resist and stand firm. Do not let yourself be off away figuring out spirituality by yourself where the enemy can just come and take you out. You need to be a part of that protection in the body. Now, it doesn't just come from us leaving the church and being off on ourselves. Sometimes it comes from within because we like to fight and we battle each other. We go head to head over things that oftentimes I, I don't think... Um, are as necessary as we'd like. Now, notice there's these two rams that are fighting, but do you see the one in the back, the third one? He's probably the one who started it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how, it, that, that's how it works, right? He's like, he's like hey, uh, do you, you hear what Bob said about you? I, don't, I wouldn't take that if I were you, I don't know. You know, stand back and then watch them go at it. And that's, that's what happens in a body of broken people. We go at each other. We instigate it. And, and in any way, whether it's off on your own or whether it comes from an end, the body of Christ suffers. Because as Jesus himself said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So what are we fighting against? Paul actually, you, you, he identifies uh, you know, the enemy of the church in, in two different ways. He says, we don't fight against flesh and blood. In other words, our neighbors, he says, we fight against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. That's one group. There are powers of this dark world. And the second group, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That is a, a much more mysterious group that we battle against. But they are both very clear enemies to God. So now let's just start with the first one. What does Paul mean by the powers of this world? And I think the, the Bible Project Classroom does a great job of explaining this. They say, Paul wants his communities, these are the people he's writing to, he wants them to know that their real enemy is never another human being, but the larger social, economic, political, and religious forces that govern and shape human existence. He's saying they are these ideologies that find their way into our social, economic, political, and religious forces that move us away from Jesus. When the ideology becomes more important than God, this becomes a power that's very influential in our culture, and we need to resist it. He continues, Paul, along with all Jews shaped by the biblical traditions, view these forces as manifestations of spiritual rulers, authorities, etc., who are opposed to the cosmic reign of the Messiah. In other words, it's why the Bible authors can refer to people like Caesar or Pharaoh as a dragon, that they are aligned with some spiritual force that is causing them to bring pain and suffering among people. That it's not just him, but there, there are forces that are coming alongside him that are causing those social, economic ideologies to take the place of God. So, I, you know, I was having this conversation in our staff meeting on Tuesday. I, I feel like I should probably come back in November and preach the same message. When we get to the height of our political temperature in this country, to be reminded that we are not at war with each other. That there are forces, though, that would like that. You know, I, I can't remember where I first heard this quote, and I couldn't find a consensus online on, on who to attribute to, so I'll just attribute it to an anonymous. 
But this is a good reminder that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against a power, a, a, an influence in, in our culture that people may be a part of, but that not is directed at just one person. It says this, if you collect 100 black ants and 100 fire ants and put them in a glass jar, nothing will happen. But if you take the jar, shake it violently and leave it on the table, the ants will start killing each other. Red believes that black is the enemy, while black believes that red is the enemy, when the real enemy is the person who shook the jar. The same is true in society. Men versus women, black versus white, faith versus science, young versus old, etc. Before we fight each other, we must ask ourselves, who shook the jar? Who is shaking the jar? I mean, I, I, look, uh, just for my own mental health, I've had to stop paying attention to a lot of the news cycle, not all of it, but m most of it over the past couple years, because it seems like all they want to do is shake the jar. And I, and I understand it because w what we have is, is in our news cycle, th their, their goal is not to just present news. They're, they're a for-profit business, and they need people to pay attention. And how do you keep people's eyes on the screen? You make them angry, or you make them scared. And that's really what's going on in a lot of our news cycles is we get connected to this stuff because we're afraid or we're angry. And they're shaking the jar. You know, some, there, there are powers in our world, talking about ideologies and people who have influence over our culture. Social media by itself is, is somewhat a, amoral, just a platform, but it has been turned into, through again, profit, for-profit business into advertising and whatnot, something that we have seen over the last 10 years specifically that is having a detrimental effect on our younger generation, in especially young girls, causing them to have uh, image issues and whatnot. And you know, you would expect the people who run these or who have influence over this to start to protect the next generation. But instead, that's not what they're doing. Profit has become more important than what is going to happen to them. So they find new ways to keep us on our screens longer and longer, which is, which is causing more and more damage. Did you guys know that Steve Jobs wouldn't let any of his kids have an iPhone or, or screens in general? So if Steve Jobs, the inventor of that, said it wasn't good for my kids. Now, look, there's moderation in everything. I'm not here to say, you know, social media is the devil. It's not. But there are powers using it for influence in our culture that is most definitely evil. And it needs to be called out because it's being influenced, I believe, and Paul is saying here, by powers, spiritual powers that have reasons that are not for our best interest. Apostle John would say this, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, there's two things here. One, John assumes we believe or we understand that there are plural spirits, multiple spirits, not just the Holy Spirit of God, but there are multiple spirits, and they are trying to influence, speak to us in ways that move us away from God. So I'm sorry you don't get to say the devil made me do it because he didn't. You know, that picture of red suit and pitchfork, that's a cartoon created image. The spirits, as the Bible talks to them, are, are of, of light. They, they want to be Beautiful, And oftentimes, here's the thing, spirits will come to you and they will encourage you to do the things you already want to do. They, uh, they'll justify it. You know what? You deserve this. Or they'll say things like, no, this is actually for their good. When it's not actually for their good, but it's not a voice from God. And we need to be able to learn to discern that. And we do that, as Paul said in Ephesians 5, by being filled with God's spirit. Because when we're filled with God's spirit, there's no room for any other spirit's voice. Because it's not just influence that happens. There are times when spirits have control over people. And, and we see this actually in Acts chapter 19 where Paul's audience in Ephesus would be very familiar with what we're going to read right here. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians. He says, some 
Oh, sorry, this is Acts. Oh, back up. Yes, an angel of light. So if Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light, then it would not be surprising if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, being right with God and being right with others. Now that spiritual influence when it moves to control is a story we find in Acts 19. It says, some Jews went around driving out evil spirits and they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. They, it's like they were going around, you know, with this, with this spell. Hey, in the name of that guy, in this guy, we command you to... It's like this phrase that they're saying, which actually doesn't have any power. It's Jesus and his spirit that actually have power. So, verse 15, one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? That's a scary moment right there. Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. And when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. Wouldn't you be? That's not the time. I've never experienced that type of spiritual encounter in my life, but I know people who have. It, it is a very real part. There is a spiritual evil, a part of our world that we don't see every day. And there are instances of things like this that have been recorded, not just 2,000 years ago, by the way. Now, Paul uses this phrase at least four times, stand firm. And, and a couple of those times, because it's a different word that gets translated in stand firm, it, it could be translated resist. Stand firm is, is kind of a, you know, uh, I don't want to say defensive, but it's a, it's a position like this. Resist is a little bit more offensive. There's a little more pushback that happens with this. And, and how does Paul say we're supposed to do that? It really outlines four things in here. First, he says, you're not going to do it in your own power. It's verse 10. You do this in the power of God. It's his mighty power that you trust. You do that by being unified together, not the gazelle off by itself, but together unified under the head of Christ. You put on his character. That's the armor of God. It's the character of Christ. And then in prayer regularly. Do that thing, that, <laughs> bookends here, okay? In God's power and in prayer, which is surrendering to him for what's going on. See, resisting this, how we fight, it's, it's, there's no magic trick to this, guys. There, there is no silver bullet or pill that says just take this. You know, I was talking to Dan this morning about, you know, there's, this, is, this takes us being saturated in God and his word and, and taking on his character, you, you, you talk to physical therapists, and, they, and after surgeries, they will tell you, it's like something like 90% of the people don't want to do the exercises that they do when they send them when they, when they go home. So they, they're not healing as well. They just say, well, just give me a pill for the pain. And that's not how this works. Paul uses this language in, in, in a couple other places, by the way, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. In Romans chapter 13, let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing and in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of your flesh. This is the same language that he's using in Ephesians. We're to put off the old, to put on the new. So where did Paul get this idea? You know, I, I didn't, as a kid, I didn't grow up reading the Hebrew scriptures like Paul did. And he is a, a scholar, knew this inside and out. And so I, I have to study for these nuggets, but they are absolute gold when you see the connections that Paul is making. Because one of the things that he's doing is he's reminding us that 
the Old Testament is not, it's not this se separate story from the New Testament. Jesus' life is a fulfillment and continuation of what God promised in the Old Testament. So when, when, when Paul makes this connection, what you're seeing is that Jesus is the fulfillment and continuation of what the prophets talked about hundreds of years before he was born. And so I'm going I'm to really go through these quickly. I've got them in your notes underneath that you can look up later. It, it, well worth your time spending some time going back through each one of these. Isaiah chapter 11. This is 700 years before Christ was born. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Does that not describe Jesus' baptism in John? Where it says the spirit of the Lord in the form of the dove comes and rests on Jesus? The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, he will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. These are the things that Paul is, is reminding, is pulling the Ephesians to here. He says in, in, uh, in uh, Isaiah 40, sorry, sorry, Isaiah 52, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The gospel, the good news of peace and salvation. Isaiah 49, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword. His words are like a sword. And Isaiah 59, the Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him. And his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet salvation on his head. All of this language, Paul is reminding us, hey, God's keeping his promises. And, and this, is, this is in the Messiah. It's not just for back then. It is true for us today. Again, the Bible Project uh, Ephesians classroom said that so well. And, and by the way, the, I've said this, I'll keep saying it. The Bible Project classrooms are seminary level teaching for free that you can get online and they are amazing classes. There's a number of them. I'd encourage you to go and check them out. This comes from their Ephesians classroom. It says, Paul explicitly links his imagery in his letters to the divine armor of the messianic king in Isaiah. The point is that God's weapons have now been transferred to the new humanity who are united in and with the Messiah. So whether it be defensive or offensive, they will need to put on the character of the Messiah and be prepared to fight. Now this is where the church starts to disagree. What does it look like to fight? What does it look like to resist? What does it look like to stand firm? And you know what? I, I have friends who are in very opposing positions on this, and I truly believe that their hearts are genuine in their desire to love and honor God and be faithful. And I believe there's room to disagree on exactly what this looks like. Now, I, when I looked at the scriptures, I, I see very clearly there are some examples that we can go to. Back to 586 B.C., the temple is destroyed, and the Israelites are taken off to captivity in, in Babylon. They get to Babylon, and they're crying out to God, what are we supposed to do here? I mean, they're going to be there for 70 years. And God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah, and he says to them, go at war with the government. No. That's not actually what he says. He says, plant gardens. Be good neighbors. Serve the benefit of your city. But there will, there will be a line for Jeremiah. He will speak the truth about the people's behavior and their rebellion of God. That, that was the line for Jeremiah. He's not going to compromise truth even though he's in captivity. Now, at the same time, you've got four other people that are in captivity in Babylon. You have Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And all of these guys work for the government. Uh -huh. They're under the king, but they also have a line. Daniel says, I'm going to pray, not to you. I'm not going to serve your gods. I'll work under this authority, but I'm not going to bow down to it. And so when he's told not to pray, he keeps praying. He gets trapped and then thrown into a lion's den, but God protects him. Yes. That was his line. Mm -hmm. 
For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was the same. They also worked for the government, but their line was not bowing down to the idols. And when they were told to, they said, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And they were thrown into a furnace of fire because of it. But God protected them and brought them out. Now, I can't promise that same thing for us today, that God will always spare us. But I will tell you, he does give us a line. He does. And for each one of us, it may, it may be a little different in what that looks like, depending on our relationship to these powers and what it looks like to push back. So have grace for each other where we disagree. Now, what are the weapons that he, Paul talks about here? He says, you got to start with the belt of truth. That's what keeps your pantalones up, okay? <laughs> w- without the belt of truth, you don't have anything else. Yes. If... You, if you take truth in a subjective way and you say, well, no, I believe Jesus here, but not here, then you don't believe in truth. Right. See, he is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so if we want to come to him, to the Father, we come through truth. I mean, Jesus is the Son of God, who he said he was. And everything he taught is what we stand on. There is no compromise in that. There's debate about what it looks like to practice in our lives, but there's no compromise in the truth. Without that, nothing else stands. So when we have that truth, then we can put on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, righteousness just simply means being right with God and with others. And that's what Paul describes in chapters 4 and 5. Put off the old self. Put on the new, the righteousness, the forgiveness, the mercy, the self-control, the honesty. All of those things. We're putting on the character of God. We, we, We are called to have feet that are quick to share the good news. See, if we don't know that, if we're not being filled by the good news of of Jesus every single day, then we're not going to recognize and understand those great promises that he has to never leave us, to never forsake us, to walk us through every single circumstance that we have in life. We're not promised to be removed from them. We're promised that God will walk with us through them. And if you don't know those truths, you can't share them with anybody else. So we know them so that we can take them and and share them. And in Christ, he is our shield of faith. See, the arrows are going to come. They may come in doubt. They may come in, in insults from other people. They'll come in whatever the enemy thinks will work to get you to quit and give up. So stand firm. Resist. See, faith is not something that can ever be taken away from you. You you can give it away, but it can't ever be taken from you. So stand firm and resist. Why? Because we have the helmet of salvation. What protects our brains, our minds, is the fact that Jesus is the Son of God who was crucified and raised from death on the third day. And because of that, you and I also will experience the resurrection of life that he did if we are in him, which means there is no threat in this world. There's nothing that this world can take from you that Christ will not give you back. I mean, what's the worst thing that the world can take from you? Your life. And you know what? To be honest, that sounds pretty bad when you say it out loud right? Like you could, the world can take our lives. But if we believe in the salvation of Jesus, then absence with the body is presence with the Lord. And we know that where we're going to experience God, there are no tears. There is no sadness, no pain, no suffering, no animosity. That sounds pretty good when you say it out loud. And that's what God has promised us. Now, the only offensive weapon in this whole list is the word of God, is the sword of his spirit, which is the word of God. That is what we take on the offense, is the truth of God found in his word. How did Jesus respond to the temptation that came to him in the desert after 40 days of fasting in Matthew chapter 4? It is written. Three times he quotes the Old Testament. 
the word of God. And if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. See, the armor of God is, is, is not a, a, a magic bullet, a pill we can take. It, it is the character of God that we put on ourselves that helps us to resist the trials and the temptations that we face. See, in Ephesus, I mean, Paul talked, this is a, a growing city, a port city where people are coming from all over. And he's got this new group of believers in there trying to figure out how to live faithfully to Jesus while the temple of Artemis stands there. Greek and Roman gods everywhere. The pressure for them to cave to their, to their society, their community was huge. And Paul needs them to stand firm. The same thing is true for us today. We are surrounded by pressure pushing us to walk away from Christ, to abandon him. And so the command for us today is the same as it was for the church in Ephesus. Stand firm in your faith in Christ. Be connected to the body under the authority and headship of Jesus so that you can resist when the methods of the devil come. Do this in the body so that we can fight for one another, for the unity of our faith and for the unity of this church here in this community, in this nation, and, and in this world. That is my prayer for all of us today. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you are good all the time. And I'm, I'm reminded of just how, you, how good you are as I get to study your word and to share the excitement that I have. And Lord, that you have given me promises. And Father, that your character is my armor. You don't promise that I won't endure trials, but you promise that you will be with me when I go through them. And that you have placed other people in my life sitting in this room right now that we would encourage one another as we face challenges and loss, struggle and suffering in our lives. Lord, that we would resist in a way that is faithful to you, that, that invites other people to become a part of this, that we're not, not doing this for ourselves, but we're doing it for each other and ultimately for your glory. Jesus, may you be honored in our lives today. Lead us and guide us. We are so grateful for the forgiveness that we find in you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to continue our worship with our offering. So we've got our ushers come forward. We'll do that now. They're going to close with a song. Thanks for being here today, guys. Have an amazing Sunday. You too. I will. stand I'm going to commit this battle to the Lord and promise to fight it the way he wants us to fight it
feel brave in the Lord's power, and we'll see you all again next Sunday. Have a great week, everybody. So, so when I'll find